It's my time to be blessed. Amen. I receive that for myself. Glory to God. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, we are here in this particular text because Moses is getting ready to basically make his last speech before the children of Israel, before the Lord takes him on home. And Moses is with the children of Israel and they are in Mob. They're right outside the Jordan. And so Moses is getting ready to tell them how they are to conduct themselves once they cross over the Jordan into Canaan. How they are to conduct themselves when they get ready to cross over the Jordan into the promised land. How many know that uh, you can act one way out there, but God wants you to act another way when you are in his presence? God is saying, you know, if you, when you come, if you're going to be a part of me, you're going to be a part of what I'm doing, then you've got to conduct yourself accordingly. Amen, somebody. And so Moses is telling the children of Israel, he said, listen now, we get ready to cross this Jordan. We get ready to go into the promised land. And the Lord would have me tell you how you are to conduct yourselves if you want to be blessed. He says here in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1, the text says, and it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God he says in verse 3, blessed shall thou be in the city, and blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall thou be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket, and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou cometh in, and blessed shall thou be when thou goeth out. The Lord shall cause thy enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face and they shall come out against thee one way and flee before these seven ways the Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou setteth thy hand unto and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee Verse 9, Moses tells the people of God, he says, The Lord shall establish thee in a holy people unto himself, and he has sworn unto thee, If thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, and walk in his ways. He says, The Lord's going to bless you. He says, You're going to be blessed in the city. Blessed in the field. He said the fruit of thy body is going to be blessed. The fruit of your ground is going to be blessed. He said he's going to cause increase to come your way. He says, but now this thing is conditional. He says it's conditional based on you harking diligently onto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I have command thee this day. He says, now the Lord wants to bless you. He wants to bless you with good health. He want to bless you with finances. He wants to bless your cattle. He says, everything you touch, he wants to bless. Turn to your neighbor and neighbor. The Lord desires to bless me. How many believe that? He says, when you get over here in this place where God's taking you, over in this place flowing with milk and honey, when you get over in Canaan, God's going to bless you. The only thing he asks you to do is to observe 
and to do what he commands you to do. The blessing of the Lord shall be upon thee if, now that if is a conjunction word meaning it's conditional. It's conditional. The blessing is connected to your obedience to do what the Lord commands you to do. I may know that when you and I walk in the obedience of Scripture, there's nothing that God would withhold from us if we so desire that thing to be and to come to pass. How many believe that? It's like this. For those of you who have children, who have raised children, you might be able to relate to me. Um, when I was raising my children, it would be times that my wife and I would tell them, well, we're going to do X and X. All you have to do is pick up a few toys and a few socks. And once you do that, we're on our way. Now you would think that would be something real easy to do, for them to pick up their own toys and their own socks so we could bless them. All we're trying to do is bless them. All we're asking you to do is do a few things. Now you think that would be a quick, swift move on our way to the blessing. No. We had to argue. We had to explain to them why they had to do it. Some of them we had to beat to do it. <laughs> and all we're trying to do is bless them. You get the picture? We have been grafted in to this particular promise. This promise God made to Israel now belongs to us. And the Lord is saying, he will bless us. He will not keep any good thing from us. He only requires that we observe and to do what he instructs us to do. Now, you would think that that would be real simple and easy. And everybody would be walking around screaming about the blessings of God. In fact, the text says that the blessings of the Lord will overtake you. Is there anybody in this room this morning that can say, I can't stand anymore? I just, Lord, stop blessing me. I can't take it. I can't take no more, Lord. Most of us are familiar with the, the phrase, New Covenant. You've heard that, that phrase, New Covenant? The New Covenant is the new arrangement. It's the new arrangement that God has with those of us who have given our lives over to him. Yeah. And at the core of the new arrangement is God putting his nature inside of us. In other words, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, God has put his nature inside of you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become, what class? New. So if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, inside your spirit, he has placed a new nature in you. You have new DNA. You have God's DNA inside of you. In fact, Romans chapter 2, verse 15, this verse says that God has written the laws on our heart. 
So when God gave us salvation, he gave us a new nature, a new spirit, his spirit, whereby we now have God within us. If you can, if your mind can get a hold of that. Now, because we have God's nature inside of us, whether you know it or not, that new nature inside of you always desires to please God. It always desires to be obedient and to bless God because you have the nature of God inside of you. Are you following me? First John chapter three, verse nine, the text says, whosoever is born of God, do not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now watch what the text says. First John three, nine, the text says, whosoever is born of God, do not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Now, let me slow this down, because I got a problem here with this text, because I still sin. And I know I'm saved. I know that heaven knows my name. I am not confused about that. I'm not confused that God knows me and accepts me as his beloved. Amen. And I know that the nature of God is in me. But if I stand here and told you I did not sin, I would probably drop dead. I still sin. You still sin. Tell your neighbor, say neighbor. Yes, you do. In fact, 1 John 1 10 says, if a man says he has not sinned, you are a liar. I don't say it. The text says it. But now watch this. The text says, anybody who is born of God cannot sin. Why? He tells us in 1 John 3, 9, because his seed is in him. What is the seed? It's that new nature. It's the spirit of God. So if you're saved, if you're born again, you have a perfect being living inside of you. Your new nature cannot sin. That's why you're the righteousness of God. And don't you ever apologize for it. You can say without a doubt, I am the righteousness of God because the spirit of God dwells in me. Now, the challenge we have is the same challenge that Paul has. Paul said, you know, the things I wanted to do, I didn't do it. The things I shouldn't have done, just like you guys, I did it. But yet, he had God's nature inside of him. So the challenge he had was, watch this, his new nature did not sin. Your new nature will not sin, but your flesh will sin and wants to sin. That's why we all have this war going on inside of us. The Bible says in Galatians that the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. And these two are enemies. These two are contrary one to another. They set themselves up and bump heads as who are going to control you. Every born again believer 
has a new nature. And that new nature is eager to please the living God. Come on, give God a praise. Now here it is. Let me see the hands of those now who say it's my time to be blessed. Uh, I don't lost a few hands. <laughs> it's okay. I know me do about this time. Living by scripture. Living by the commandments of God. Living by the word of the living God is not supposed to be difficult. Moses told the children of Israel, he says, listen, we right here in Moab land, there's the Jordan right there. All we got to do is cross over this Jordan into the promises of God. He says, all you have to do is to observe his commandments, keep his commandments, and he has said he will bless your body, he bless your finances, he'll bless your cattle, he'll bless your family, blessed in the city, blessed in the field, in other words, wherever your feet go, it's blessed ground. That was Moses' last speech. They stayed in that spot for a long time. It wasn't until Joshua came on the scene and Joshua finally told him, I know what Moses said. I know he done told you, you know, you got to be obedient. You got to do this. You got to do that. And God going to bless you. Joshua, I got a new message for you. I'm not staying over here in Mobland like Moses did. He said, listen, I'm going to give it to you straight. If it seems to you, and I'm paraphrasing, to be a problem to obey God, then that's on you. But Joshua said, for as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. In other words, Joshua said, I'm going over. And if you coming, you better come on. Hallelujah, somebody. I said, hallelujah, somebody. Joshua said, listen, this thing's not hard. All you got to do is make a decision that it is your time to be blessed. I make the decision for my house. It's time for me and my house to be blessed, and we're going over. And whatever the Lord says do, that's what we're going to do. Joshua said, it should not be hard to obey the Lord. 1 John 5, 3 says the same thing. It says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. New Living Translation says, loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And the Message Translation says, do we love God? Do we keep his commands? The proof that we love God comes when we keep his commandments, and they are not at all troublesome. John's saying the same thing that Joshua said. This thing ought to be easy. Shoot, there's a blessing attached to this thing. In fact, wherever I put my feet is blessed. All I got to do is what thus says the Lord. So let me say this. If you are burdened this morning in your walk with the Lord, if you are in any kind of way weighed down and feel a weight of doing what the scriptures say do, if you, if you find it a struggle to obey God, most likely something's going on with you. And I don't mean that as a, as a, a put down. I don't mean that as a rebuke. I'm just trying to, the Bible says you should know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. If you find it hard to do what the Lord says do, 
it probably is the, 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 the possibility that you're trying to serve him and you're trying to uh, have a relationship with him through religion. And if you try to do this thing through religion, it's not going to work. Because God never called us to religion. He never called us to tradition. He never called us to customs. He called us into a relationship. And when you come into relationship, it becomes easy. Jesus says, if you love me, you, you will keep my commandments. He made it very simple. He said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. I don't have to make you. You won't complain about it. You won't make excuses about doing it. You won't lose any sleep over it. He says, you simply do it because we have relationship. You love me. Amen, somebody. You know, you, you, you have, and you hear these stories, Brother Lament, about these wives who, and these husbands who had to make their wives do something. Got to make her cook. I got to make her do this. Got to make her uh, clean the house. Got to make her do X. Or I have to make him cut the grass. I got to make him pay the bills. I got to make him feed the dog. I got to make him pick up his own dirty stuff. We got to fight over the trash going out. We got to fight over The light being cut off again. We, we got to fight over all this. I'm going to tell you why you're fighting. Because there ain't no love. When there's love, it's easy. It's easy to pay the light bill. I don't want my wife in the dark. Easy to cut the grass. I don't want them stepping out there in the grass. And it's easy to Pick up the, the cleaning from the cleaners. You pick it up, I picked it up last time. Get your own stuff. I work just like you work. I'm tired too. You ain't no one I'm tired. I'm tired. That happens because there's no love. Same thing in the church. I'm going to leave it alone, though, because it's past appreciation. Make sure y'all still, I don't want to mess this month up. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, he's, he's smart, right? He don't want to mess it up. <laughs> Get on back to what I'm supposed to be doing here. Real quick, I'm going to get you home. Three things when it comes to the blessings of God and the obedience of God. Three things that I think might help you in terms of being able to take scripture and apply it to your life. To be able to take the promises of God and see them translated from, from the page, from the book, into your life. See, it's one thing to read about the promises of God. It's another thing to live them out in your life. And I'm telling you, I've done both. I've read the promises, and I have seen the promises lived out in my life. And I'm telling you, it's a lot better having that stuff lived out in your life than it is reading about it and somebody else giving the testimony. Some of you ought to be tired of other people giving a testimony. You don't have the testimony. Amen, Amen somebody. Three things, real quick. Three things. Give you the mini version. And this is a very simple one. When it comes to obeying 
the Word of God and acting out according to Scripture. We simply do it whether we have full understanding or not. Oftentimes, we think we have to have full understanding of why we had to do certain things that we read from the text. When it comes to obedience, sometimes you may understand and sometimes you may not understand why, but it doesn't matter why. If God says do it, simply do it. Amen, somebody. The word says do it, so I do it. Why you do it? Because the word says do it. And then later on, as you grow and as you mature, you understand, oh, ooh, I get that now. But sometimes we think that, you know, because we don't understand, we shouldn't obey. We have to obey even when we fully don't understand. Over in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to verse 2, the Lord, he tells Abram, he says, get out of that country and from that kindred and from the father's house unto a land which I will show thee. He said, I want you to leave your kinfolks and I'm going to show you a land. He doesn't tell him where to go. He says, just get out of there, start moving, and I'll tell you where you're going to go. And then he says this, he says, once you obey me, he says, I will make thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. Amen. Now watch this. Understanding can wait. Obedience cannot. Please hear me. When God says do something, understanding of why he says do something can wait, but obedience cannot. Because God, the God we serve, does not speak anything to you past your last act of disobedience. If he says turn right and you go left and it's 2002 and you back up in 2022 and you still ain't turn right, you still there. God ain't spoke nothing else different to you. He said, you know what, 12 years ago I told you to do this, I, I'm still there with you. <laughs> my kids, yeah, I love my kids. I, I don't know why I'm on this kid thing today. I don't know. Growing up, there were certain things they didn't like to eat on their plate. And sometimes I just get honored. I'm like, you ain't getting up to eat it. You ain't going nowhere. You're going to sit there and eat it. I did it because that's what my parents did to me. And I should have known better because it didn't work back then. It didn't work with me and I'm trying to do the same thing, right? Stupidity. You're not moving there. You're not going anywhere until you eat so-and-so, so-and-so. Uh, uh, two hours later, you come back. I'm done. You're like, good. And you pat yourself on the back because you think you've done something. I showed them. I'm the bad. I find out probably um, this year. They was dumping stuff in the trash. Throwing stuff outside. <laughs> I think we was at her 25th birthday party, Jeremy 30th. So we, some, this year, I just found out they, they didn't eat nothing. I'm looking at them like, y'all didn't eat? No, we didn't eat that. Stuff and stuff in their pockets. I had a point. The point is, God's not going to move past the lack act of disobedience. If God instructed you to do something this morning, and you know he instructed you to do it, you need to understand if you have not done it, God's still there. And he's not moving that spot until you obey. And partial obedience, please hear me, in the eyes of the living God is disobedience. Go ahead, give him a praise. second thing is this. When dealing with obeying God and receiving the blessings of the Lord, and that is we have to deal with our thought process. We have to deal with those, those thoughts that come across our mind when we're challenged with obeying the word of God. One of the things I have found 
is oftentimes when the Lord tells me to do something or I read scripture about doing something, the first thing that, that attacks me is my thought process. Thoughts come up trying to hinder me from doing what the Lord instructs me to do. But the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So we had to continue to purge our thoughts because we become what we think. Yeah. We become what we think. And so we have to continue to purge our thoughts, especially when it comes to the obedience of God. How I many know that obedience is difficult when you have a preference of what you want to do. Obedience is easy when you want to do something. It's only difficult when you have another preference. When you, when you want to do something different than what the scripture says, that's when the challenge comes. Amen, somebody. And that's when we got to get, deal with our thought process and bring our thoughts in line with scripture. Now, why it says just a word, just one word from God can free your mind. How many believe that? Amen. This word is so powerful. It's alive, the text says in Hebrews. Sharper than any two-edged sword. This word has the anointing and the power whereby it can heal things in your life that you thought could not be healed. There's not a disease that they have named that the blood cannot take care of. There's not a demon in operation that cannot be bound by this word. This word can heal stuff in your life, in your physical body, that your mind would tell you cannot be healed. Your mind would tell you your marriage is broken, it cannot recover. I beg to differ. Your doctor would tell you you have a disease and you cannot recover. I beg to differ. Your bank account and your banker will tell you you don't qualify or you don't have enough. I beg to differ. This word can heal things in your life that you thought was impossible. He said in Psalms 107, 20, he sent his word and healed them. And deliver them from all their, what class? Destructions. This word right here. This word. Can change. Your life. This is why the enemy fights us so much. And tries to keep us from obeying the word. He doesn't want you free. He doesn't want you to have victory. He wants you to debate whether or not God is able. Debate whether or not, well, God did it for him, but he may not do it for you. He, he wants to kick all this foolishness around in your mind. And, you know, at our weak places, our weak spots in life, sometimes we entertain that foolishness. Sometimes we entertain those thoughts. Well, maybe God won't. I know he did it for them, but. But the doctor said, I, I just don't see how this can happen. I don't see how this can, can come to pass because I, I, just, I just don't, I don't see it. You don't need to see it. You just need to obey it. And then the last thing was this, and I'm done. When it comes to receiving the blessings of God, we simply had to obey under pressure. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got to learn how to obey God under pressure. 
That's a good place to give him a praise right there. God will make a request of us just to see how we will respond. I said, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you will make a request of you just to see how you will respond. You say you want to be blessed. We ask God to do certain things in our lives. We get on our knees and we pray, Lord, if you just do this certain thing for me. And Lord says, okay, let me just see how, if they really want to really be blessed. Jesus, going through Galilee, he sees Peter. And other disciples, they just come in from fishing. Been out all night. The text says, I hadn't caught a thing. Peter, the Zebedee brothers, they, they own the company. They fish for a living. This is what their this was their occupation. They, this was what they did. This is how they pay the bills. They've been out all night. They come in to the shore, and Jesus says, you know, take your boat out. Peter's like, dude, I'm paraphrasing. Lord, we've been out all night. All night we've been out there. Now, he could have said, listen, Jesus, I own a fishing company. I know fishing. There's nothing out there tonight. But Jesus wanted to show them something. Take your boat out. And Peter, out of obedience to the word, he didn't believe because the text says he was astonished. He did not believe Jesus. I said he did not believe Jesus. He did it out of respect to Jesus. Jesus challenges him to see if he's going to obey because Jesus has another assignment. He said, if I can get him to obey this, then I'll get him to obey me when I'm later on when I, I'm taking off the earth because I'm going to make him fisher of men. I'm going to get him to go after souls. But I'm going to test him on this one. The text says when he casts his boat out, you know the story. They caught so many fish that the boats begin to sink. They had one boat caught another boat, they begin to sink. The text says they were amazed at the blessing that came because of their obedience to Christ. The Lord tells the man of God, he says, I want you to take Isaac, take him out to the mount, mountain of Moriah. He tells Abraham, you take Isaac, your son, your only son, you take him up and offer him up on Mount Moriah. In other words, you sacrifice that boy. Abraham took him up. But that's where the promise was coming from. He said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. I'm going to bless thee. That blessing was coming through Isaac. Y'all not listening to me. Y'all bored, aren't you? And Abraham took him up. Abraham did not understand this instruction from the Lord, but the text says that Abraham in his heart, he said he, he, he saw God raise him up in a, in a figure. In other words, Abraham in his mind was saying, well, if he killed a boy, he's got to raise him up because he made me a promise. In other words, Abraham was at the point where God was like, I'm just going to do it because he's got to keep his word. <laughs> He's got, even if he killed his boy, he's going to have to raise him up. He's going to do something because he promised me to be a father of many nations to coming through this boy's loins. 
many understand what I'm saying? There's times where God will require us to do things that we do not fully understand. But behind the obedience is the blessing of God. Come on, give him a praise. Here's the thing. It's up to us to choose the blessings of God. I asked in the beginning, who would say it's my time to be blessed, be blessed and everybody's hand went up, just about everybody's hand went up. But how many know that you had to choose that time? It's not something that just falls on you. It's a choice. It is a decision of your will to say to yourself, I will be blessed of God. My family will be blessed of God. My finances shall be blessed of God. My body shall be blessed of God. My career shall be blessed of God. My ministry shall be blessed of God. My business shall be blessed. I don't care nothing about inflation. I don't care nothing about the craziness of, of the Congress and the I don't care about hurricane. I don't care about any of that. I pray for what I see, but none of that affects my obedience to scripture. Let me understand what I'm saying. He says in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26 to 28, I'm almost done, five minutes. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. Now understand, when he, when he says curse, how I many know God does not curse people? I said God does not curse people. What he's talking about are the consequences that happen because you choose not to obey the word. Is what he's saying. Now here it is. Here's the application and I'm done. I'm just, I'm out of time. I'm just going to give it to you. Here's the application. Here's the simplicity of, of, of being blessed of God and obeying his scripture. It's in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. One of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible, as far as I'm concerned. It says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Make that verse one of your devotional uh, texts, uh, one of your devotional verses until you get that in your spirit, until it becomes a part of you as a Christian. This verse is simply saying that the foundation of obedience is the meditation of the word. I said the foundation of obedience is the meditation of the word. You cannot obey what you do not know. But if you meditate on this word and this word becomes a part of who you are, you will no longer even have to question whether or not you're going to do it. It becomes a part of who you are. How many understand what I'm saying this morning? Some of you this morning, you pray. And you pray not because they call a prayer meeting, not because it's time to pray. You pray because prayer has become a part of who you are as a believer. It's just a part of your DNA now. No, and you pray all by yourself. You don't need nobody to pray with you. You don't need nobody to ask you to pray. You don't need no alarm clock to get you up to pray. You don't need nobody to ask you, did you pray today? Are you going to pray today? No, you just pray because that's just who you are. You are an assessor. You just, you just been, that's just who you are now. It's like brushing your teeth. No one has to make you brush your teeth. You brush your teeth because that's just what you do. Some of you, you tithe, and you tithe because no one has to give you Malachi 3. No one has to tell you that the blessings of the Lord are going to come up on you and overtake you. No one has to make you tithe. No one has to make you feel guilty about tithing. No one has to explain to you about whether or not tithing is the Old Testament, New Testament, before the... the, the, the. <laughs> 
That's just who you are. That's just who you are. The more you meditate on this word, it becomes a part of who you are. And once this word, the Bible talks about the engrafted word of God, James. Do a skin graft. You take one piece of skin from one part of your body and graft it into another part of your body. And that once that skin is infused into another part of your body, you can't pull it apart. It's just a part now of that new area. That's the word of God. I mean, no, and I'm done. I'm just, I'm rambling now. You can make your decision right now that from this day forward, this day and every day is my day to be blessed. And how does that happen? Whatever the Lord say do, this is what I do. And I leave the results up to him. Let's give him a praise. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Let's give him a praise. Yes, God. Listen, if you're here this morning, or you're watching my social media, and you're not saved, you have not given your life to Christ, I want you to know from your Bible, the scripture says, it is God will that all men be saved and come into the saving knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. God wants to have a relationship with you. So if you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity. I want to tell you from a personal experience, if you accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it will be without question the greatest decision you have ever made in your life and your life will change and it will change for the better. Amen, somebody. So if you're here and you say, Pastor, I, I need Christ. I need Jesus in my life and I want him in my life. All you have to do is just simply repeat after me. Confess it with your mouth and believe in your heart and your life will change. And I'm telling you, it will be a radical change. It will be a change that you would forever cherish. So I'm going to ask you, everyone in the sanctuary, we have media, just repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you forgive me of all of my sins. I truly believe that Jesus Christ is your son who suffered on the cross and died. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead. And he's now seated at your right hand praying for me that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Father, I'm asking for Jesus Christ to come into my life, to come into my heart, and to be my personal Lord and Savior. Now, Father, by faith, I believe that I am saved, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 If you're in the sanctuary and you pray that prayer for the first time, wave at me so we can give you some information. If I, by way of social media, if you pray that prayer for the first time, there's some information on the screen. Contact us. We want to celebrate with you. Amen. We want to celebrate with you. Amen. Well, are you ready to worship the Lord in your giving? Amen. I'm going to ask Pastor Jackson to come. Praise God. I'm going to read from uh, Malachi. Malachi. The third chapter. Familiar verse of scripture. And the tenth verse. Let me just back up to the eighth verse, because there's something in there I was wondering about. 
when I read it some time ago and I was thinking about it. The eighth verse said, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithe and offering. And it goes on to say, You are cursed with a curse, you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there is not be that there shall not be room enough to receive. And I was wondering about that a while back. Uh, of course, we know uh, tithe and offering. Uh, a lot of folks said tithe was under the law, but actually tithe started with Abraham. He tithe to Melchizedek, and that was long before the law was established. But tithe is just a template. You can give as much as you want to give, or you can give even whatever the Lord put in your heart to give. But one of the things I thought about that the Lord said, he said, you robbed me in tithe and offering. The tithe was the only thing that belonged to God. And I was concerned when he said, you robbed me in tithe and offering. I'm like, Lord, the offering belongs to me, and it's my decision to give offering. The tithe belonged to you, but the offering belonged to me. And I was always curious about how he had said that you robbed me in tithe and offering. And I thought about something my mom used to tell me. My mom used to always try to give me money. And I was like, Mama, no, I don't need you to, to bless me. Because it's my time to bless you. But what she would share with me was, baby, the Lord moved on me to bless you. And if I don't bless you, I'm going to hold up my blessing. You're going to block my blessing. And so I realized that God said you robbed me in tithe and offering. When you give you the tithe, that belonged to God, but the offering belonged to you. But when you give offering, it opens up the opportunity for God to bless you. And God said, how you robbed me? You robbed me from the opportunity to do what's in my heart to do for you. And so often we, we, we miss on God uh, 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 allowing us to be a blessing to us because God's sole purpose in, in his eternal being is to bless his people. And when we don't give our offering and give our, what, our sacrifice unto God, we, call, we, we shut God from being able to do what's in his heart to do for you. And that is to bless you. There's no shortage in finances. There's no shortage in the kingdom of God in resources. And one way to lose those resources is to give unto God. To give unto his ministry, his purpose. To give unto his house. He set that up as a way to bless us. And, and I've been blessed so, like Pastor Doug said in his message. It's one thing to read about it, but it's another thing to live it and experience it. And I must say I've experienced the blessings of God that make it be rich and add no sorrows to your life. In other words, you ain't got to go to sleep that you cheated somebody because you're blessed. You ain't got to miss your rest at night because you robbed to get what you got. No, every good and perfect gift I receive have come from my father up above the father of lights in whose there's no shadow of turning from blessing you amen so let me just encourage you one way to be blessed to have a residual effect the blessing coming to your household coming to your children's children is to learn the secret of giving into the kingdom of God that old song, you can't be God-given, is true. It is for me. I don't know about nobody else. You can't be God-given, no matter how you try. The more you give, the more he'll give to you. And that is true in my heart. Amen. The usher's going to uh, 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 encourage you to give.
the name of Jesus lift it high, lift it high, lift it high. The name of Jesus lift it high. In this place, in this place. The name of Jesus, the name of Jesus lift it high, lift it high, lift it high. The name of Jesus lift it high, in this place. The name. The name of Jesus lift it high, lift it high, lift it high. The name of Jesus lift it high. in this place. In this place. The name of Jesus, the name of Jesus lift it high, lift it high, lift it high. The name of Jesus, the name of Jesus lift it high in this place. Praise God. Have everyone that have had the opportunity to give have given? Well, point your hand toward the offering. Father, we thank you for the offering which have been given today from the depth of our heart. We thank you for this sacrifice. And we thank you, Father, that there's a hundredfold return on our giving. We thank you that the blessings of God make us rich and add no sorrow to our life. We bind every hindering spirit that will come against our blessing. And we thank you, Father, for blessing each and every giver and those that didn't even have to give but desire to give. We thank you for a blessing being on their life. In Jesus' name, we decree it this day. You said, concerning the works of my hand, command ye me. And Father, your hand desire to bless us. And we command it to be so. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.